So welcome everyone. I briefly sort of chatted before. This is the uh, third installment of the Wellington County Collect series, lecture series that have been inspired by the Talk to Me exhibit. So we are fortunate enough tonight to have such a special guest from Whiteman, Paul Whiteman, who's co-chair and owner of Whiteman Telecom. Um, he'll be speaking tonight on the history of Whiteman, um, which is a great story in Wellington County, especially an independent telephone story. And it's a great segment for us to chat about at the end of our series. And he'll be speaking on the history of Whiteman and the fa his family legacy and the company, talking and sharing about some stories and how the company was started, sharing some a uh, little bit of uh, well, photographs about this, uh, the company itself and really representing uh, the, his legacy um, and the future of Whiteman itself. Uh, one, Whiteman, why I love this uh, company too as well as I worked with uh, Paul uh, on the Whiteman exhibit of the first 110 years um, in 2018. It was such a privilege because I got to learn about the real family legacy that was left behind and continues to be left behind in Wellington County. It's a strong telephone company that started in 1908 and has such a real inspirational uh, part to our history here in Wellington County. And it's such a treasure to invite him here and to share it, to share that story. So thank you, Paul, for joining us this evening. Uh, thanks, uh, Emily and Amy. Uh, it's a real treat to be here. I enjoy doing these sorts of presentations. Uh, it's a lot of fun for me. It is a bit challenging because I'm used to talking to uh, a real life crowd as opposed to a computer screen. But uh, we're gonna have some fun and hopefully uh, everybody can learn a little bit about uh, Whiteman history. Fact of the matter is that as a company, Whiteman has a history that goes back over 112 years in four generations of family ownership. This combination of a telecommunications company that's been family owned for over a century is totally unique and doesn't exist anywhere else in Canada. In fact, plans are in place to transition the ownership at this time to the fifth generation in the future. A few years ago as uh, Amy was telling us uh, we were able to collaborate with the Wellington County Museum to put together a display that featured technical changes and individual accomplishments in each generation. Their recommendation at the time was that the family history was a good human interest story and that by itself was as interesting as the artifacts and antiques themselves. So as an extension of that theme, this presentation is focused on events and accomplishments uh, that led up to the success of each of the generational owners. We'll see how each generation took significant risks and had to make tough decisions so that the company could survive for the benefit of the future generations. As we bring the chronological overview up to current times, we'll naturally take a brief glimpse into the future and set the stage for maybe the next generation to carry on. Sometimes during presentations like this, people seem to be a little bit confused about how or why someone could have started a phone company from scratch well over a century ago. To really understand this, we need to go back in time at least 180 years to look at a series of events that created that opportunity for our great grandfather to follow his dreams. And for the most part, our story is centered around the former village of Clifford, which is a small town in the northwest corner of Wellington County. The village of Clifford was originally incorporated in 1874 and is near the intersection of four counties, Gray, Bruce, Huron, and Wellington. Here we see Robert. Robert is my great-grandfather. And... Uh, he will come into the story in a few years, but we'll take a look at this slide. In 1841, 13-year-old William Whiteman emigrated to Canada from Ireland with his parents and three siblings. William and his family settled in Burlington area where they lived and worked. 
1862, William married Margaret Ann Fair, and by 1865, this guy, Robert, was born. By 1875, the area around Clifford was being developed. You can well imagine what it would have been prior to that, very much wilderness. Uh, it was part of what was known as the Queen's Bush. And, uh, but, it, but by the latter part of the 1800s, it was being developed. William and his family were granted crown land in Huron County, about two and a half miles west of Clifford. There they homesteaded a farm where they built a log house and a barn. Coincidentally, one year later, Alexander Graham Bell in, invented the telephone. Almost immediately, he sold the Canadian patent to National Bell Telephone Company of Boston. National Bell sent Charles Sice to Canada to build a Canadian national network. By 1880, Sice had received a charter from the Canadian Parliament for exclusive rights to build a national telephone service, including exclusive rights for all the manufacturing. This was a huge undertaking, and before long, the eastern and western provinces were complaining of inadequate service. Parliament became very frustrated, so they rescinded Bell's charter. And as a result, Bell sold its interest in the west and the eastern parts of Canada, and decided to concentrate on central Ontario and Quebec. And Bell's focus was on urban areas. They had very little interest in rural areas or small towns. By 1886, Bell built the first telephone line from Guelph to Walkerton along the Allure Road. We now know that as Road, Wellington Road 7. They installed a single telephone in the Clifford Post Office. There, messenger boys would wait by the phone and they were paid five cents to deliver messages or to summon people to the phone if they were wanted by the caller. What you're looking at here is the first Bell line crew in Clifford. And it's kind of a neat old picture. The horse, this is uh, headed north. That old building behind is long gone. Um, you can see the gentleman standing at the head of the wagon in his suit. He would have been the boss or the foreman. And the rest of them are a uh, Riley looking bunch of dudes that are ready to go to work. And in case you're wondering, and you can see it, there's a sign over the horse's head on the wall and it says, that's a dentist office if you had the nerve to go in, in those days. Um, this particular picture is kind of interesting too. This is also a, a Bell uh, line crew back in the day. Uh, I don't think that this one is near Clifford, but it's interesting to see just the same. Uh, we can see a lots of the, the hardware, uh, some of the neat things in the picture. They're using a steam engine and I think I can see probably what looks like uh, steam-powered um, uh, hammer drill type things. Um, you'll notice the foreman off to the right in the bowler hat and the suit and the camp cook beside him. You can only imagine working from sun up till sun down and then coming back and living in a camp like this. Um, some of the fun things, if you notice the man in the lower right hamming it up, He's using a thing called a wire chief test set. In those days, he would have used that, gone up, clipped on the line, and used it to ring central and talk to the operator to test the line. And there he is with the receiver up to his ear, hamming it up for the photo. Whoops, sorry. By 1896, Robert, now 31 years of age, married Trifina Kerwin. They were given the farm and a new house as a wedding gift. There they raised eight children, Margaret, William, Benjamin, Trifina, Burlington, Ida, Violet, and Borden. I keep going the wrong way. In those days, everybody named their farms, and the Whiteman farm was called Evergreen Acres. And this is a 
kind of a quarter view of the house. What's interesting now, it's about turn of the century. By 1905, Parliament considered nationalizing telephone service similar to the model that they used in Britain, where the British Post Office ran all the phone networks. Until that time, Bell was strongly opposed to working with independents, but the threat of nationalization caused them to become much more co cooperative with other companies, and soon they would change their position, and they started to encourage small systems to start up. In the early 1900s, uh, Bell installed the first switchboard in Clifford. This is a picture of the actual board in, in the office. And uh, they inst also installed several lines to businesses in town. And um, what's interesting about this is that switchboard would end up in our possession years and years and years ago. And my dad donated it to Bell. And it ends up in their museum. And at one point, uh, many years ago, when I was on business in Toronto with uh, dad, uh, we dropped by the Bell Building in Trinity Square, and it, that, that very switchboard was on display in the lobby of that Bell Building. Robert Whiteman, about that time, approached Bell to have the service extended to his farm, but Bell denied his request. They weren't interested in serving rural Ontario. In 1908, the Ontario government passed the Local Municipal Telephone Act, which governed the establishment and operation of independent phone companies. The provincial government was actually promoting the concept of municipalities establishing phone systems as municipally owned utility companies. In spite of this, Robert decided he would begin to build and, and connect his own uh, uh, neighbors to his lines. In 1909, based on the rules in the act, and that act, by the way, was existed until recent times when there was a court decision that deemed that we ought to be all regulated by the CRTC or the federal regulatory body. And, and at that time, that act would have uh, gone by the wayside. But it was in place from 1908 until recent years. 1909, Robert Whiteman Telephone System receives approval from the Ontario Railway and Municipal Board. He had invested uh, 2,500 capital dollars, which would have been a good sum of money in the day. Uh, he had 55 customers on five lines, 17 miles of iron wire on 530 poles. His rates were $9 a year. And if you wanted access to Bell's long distance, it was an extra $3. Long distance rates in those days were 10 cents for three minutes, up to 35 miles. This, by the way, is uh, a picture of uh, Robert and Trifina's farmhouse. This is where his first switchboard would have been to, to uh, switch the first five lines. Um, what's interesting about this picture, you can see some of his favorite toys on the, on the uh, porch with him, his gramophone. Well, the gramophone is unique because uh, his switchboard was in the house and in the evenings, especially on the weekends, Ro Robert would play the gramophone over the phone lines to entertain his customers. And on top of that, he wrote a rule book. And here we see the cover on the left and two specific pages out of it. The rule book contained 22 articles that established etiquette and the guidelines on how to use the phone, which was new to many. It was written in both English and German, which reflected the large German population in the area at the time. And the rules varied from warnings to never use the phone during a thunderstorm, to fines to be issued to those who listened on party lines, or fines of $10 for quarreling, or using abusive language. The other thing that Robert used was a book, we see the cover of it here on the right, um, that was 
published by Northern Electric. We remember Northern as Nortel in more recent years before they disappeared. And it was entitled, How to Build a Rural Telephone Line. The interesting thing to me in this is that it was dedicated to the progressive Canadian farmer. And it tells me an awful lot about the uh, situation that existed at the time. They, they were really looking to people, especially farmers, who were very, very isolated. Uh, you know, there was no electricity, roads were poor, uh, no forms of entertainment. Uh, very isolated uh, existence in those days, but they were looking to those people to, to uh, promote and get into the business, uh, and of course their purpose is to sell equipment. The other thing we saw at the time was an advertisement like this, and this particular one is on the, on the Farmer's Advocate, big ad on the front page, get your neighbors together and organize an independent telephone system. And this is dated in around 1911. Um, also, lots of advertising during the Depression that pr promoted the benefits of farmers having the telephone. And by 1910, there were 460 Ontario-based companies in operation, mostly in rural areas and small towns where Bell was not interested. What's interesting about this is Robert had done reasonably well, to be honest, in his rural environment. And within two or three years, um, he had reached 100 customers. And so because of his numbers, Bell agreed to give him a connection to the long distance um, uh, on the switchboard in Clifford. And in addition to that, they made him the Bell agent in Clifford. And so he decided he would move his office from the farmhouse to the building we see here, which is at the corner of Geddes and Alora Street. And that building would become um, the home to the Whiteman family for about the next 80 years. By 1920, he had 270 rural customers, and by 1921, there were 689 independent phone companies in Ontario. A couple of interesting things in this photo. Um, the girl on the left is Robert's oldest daughter. The, the gentleman on, the two gentlemen in the center, one on the left is, uh, is the bell manager. Robert standing uh, with the hat on next to the horse. The gentleman driving the wagon is a man by the name of Chester Cook. And we'll see him in the next uh, photo. And what's interesting about that is uh, Chess was around for years and years and years. And I even remember him as a young boy. And he was always good to us kids. And uh, he was a really nice gentleman. But here we see him driving the wagon in 1911. Um, and here's just a fun photo. Uh, Robert with uh, the straw hat on and Chester uh, driving, uh, we think it's a 1914 McLaughlin. Uh, McLaughlin was a big uh, carriage builder back in the day. And um, eventually McLaughlin, Buicks, and so on. And it, it got um, absorbed, I believe, by General Motors eventually. But I think they're out on a service call here. So Robert's time uh, was probably shorter because he started later in life. But I think his accomplishments, of course, were pretty obvious. He built the first rural lines, acquired all kinds of customers because of the demand. And uh, he, he became the local bell agent, which really set him up for the future. In 1925, Robert's son, Ben, or Benjamin, married Lila Schnur. These would be my grandparents. They raised four children, Joy, Ray, Isla, and Len. Uh, ben joined the business. Lila worked as a switchboard operator. And Robert and Trifina by then had moved to town, and the oldest son, Bill, took over the farm. In 1928, Robert retired and sold the business to my grandparents, Ben and Lila. 
the company was changed, uh, the company's name was changed to the Whiteman Telephone System. In the same year, a man by the name of Clarence Silly Green appears from nowhere. We know he was the linesman for the South Bruce Rural Telephone Company from Teeswater, and he made a deal with Bell to buy several small exchanges in the area, including Clifford, Aiton, and Newstead. But within months, Ben purchased Clifford, Aiton, and Newstead exchanges directly from Bell. The details of this transaction still remain a mystery, but we found historic documents that show that the deal was finalized with Mr. Green's permission. Uh, it, as I say, still a mystery. It's not clear how that all came to be, but it, it, it uh, worked out in Ben's favor. The acquisition raised the customer count to about 400. In late 29, stock market crashed. Ben and Lila had debts to pay. They had borrowed money privately to purchase the company from Robert and the exchanges from Bell. During the Depression, telephone rates fell. Parliament passed a bill that allowed farmers to forgive some of their debts. Often, farmers would trade produce as a way of settling their telephone accounts. And by the early 1930s, Ben's oldest brother, Bill, had become the manager of the Sebringville Exchange near Stratford. In 1931, Ben's youngest brother, 19-year-old Borden, was electrocuted while working on the lines for his brother Bill near Seabringville. In 1930s, my grandmother Lila would usually be the night operator. This would involve sleeping next to the switchboard on a daybed and being ready to handle a call if someone needed to use the phone during the night. On a particular evening, Lila summoned another operator, a Marjorie Newton, to come into work because she needed help. Marjorie was also a trained nurse, and Grandma, who was expecting, was sure that it was time for the baby to arrive. On that night in 1932, my Aunt Isla was born on the daybed beside the switchboard. Then, in 1933, Robert Whiteman died. Now, as we go through the Depression, you can see in 1933, things weren't that good. Handwritten letters to all the customers saying, we will give you a discount of $2.50. Remember, this is on a bill of about uh, what did, uh, about $9 a year. We will give you a discount per year if you keep your bill paid up. That's a huge reduction. But they did that to ensure likely that they had the cash flow. By 1939, World War II began. Materials were rationed. Money was in short supply. And uh, the end of the Second World War brought renewed hope and optimism. And then, in 1948, our grandfather Ben died unexpectedly. This crisis put my grandmother um, Lila in the center of a dilemma of whether to sell the business or not to sell the business. She decided to assume ownership of the Whiteman Telephone System. She promised her family that she would continue to build the business for the future benefit of her family. Her young adult children, Joy, Ray, Isla, and Len, all worked to help her out. We believe that she was likely the first and only woman in Canada to own and operate her own telephone company. Here's 
Here we see Ben and Lila um, with their family um, and a list of some of the things they accomplished. I think the most significant, of course, in my mind is maintaining the business through probably the toughest economic times that existed in the last hundred years or more. Lila's oldest son, Ray, who is my father, left school after his dad died to begin working with his mother, and he eventually would assume the role of manager. This picture is a little bit newer, but dad and mom were married in 51. Uh, he married Ruth Litt, who is mo our mother on the right here, raised three children, Mary who's in the center, uh, Blair on the left, and I'm on the right. Um, and of course, we lived in that building. We saw a few slides ago that uh, it was dated 1911. This picture would be taken probably in the mid-60s, uh, I think. Um, but we lived in the apartment above the telephone office, and Grandma lived uh, in a small apartment behind the business office and switchboard. Switchboard would have been just inside the uh, door there at the corner. And uh, mom would also serve as a night operator on a part-time basis and she worked for many years in the business office. Um, dad worked as a lineman uh, building and maintaining the poles and wires. Um, at the end of the day I uh, remember as a young kid he would often come home wearing his climbing belt and spurs, if you were a lineman in those days, you didn't take those things off because you were probably up a pole most of the time. And he would come home and he would come up the stairs and take his gear off and hang them behind the coal stove that heated the apartment. And this would ensure that they were warm and dry for the next morning when he'd put his gear back on and head back out the door to go to work. And I actually remember this, and it's a true story, uh, I remember a time, it's likely in the late 50s, and Dad came home from work with a trunk load of uh, old wooden phones in the trunk of his car. And uh, old wooden magneto phones, and in those days old phones weren't worth very much, so what did he do with them? He dumped them all out on the side of the street, in front of the old barn behind the office, and he lit him on fire. Well, he retrieved the copper and the precious metals out of them and sold them to the scrap dealer for a little bit of spending money. It seems strange today that this little bit of scrap would have been worth more than the actual phone itself. But uh, that, that, that's the truth. It, that's the way, it was a different time back then. In early, in 1954, a devastating sleet storm uh, flattened almost all of the poles and wires. It took months to rebuild the system. In those days, customers understood the situation and were willing to wait patiently while the system was rebuilt. Prior to 1954, the Newstead switchboard was operated by a pair of spinster sisters who refused to work after 6 p.m. As a result, the telephones couldn't be used during the evenings and night. As my grandmother contemplated what to do, one day completely by chance, a man traveling north had car troubles. So he came into the telephone office to call the local garage. He introduced himself and said he sold automatic telephone switching equipment. Well, this was the opportunity my grandmother uh, needed. So she committed to install a brand new automatic four digit dial exchange in Newstead in 1954. In the meantime, the ice storm came as a major setback. She wanted to cancel the order. The company wouldn't allow it. This was reported to be the first automatic dial exchange in Ontario, north of London. And the upgrade resulted in significant increase in sales and the numbers of customers in the Newstead area. That, by the way, uh, I show this picture because the man cutting the ribbon is Uncle Jack. That would be my grandmother's brother. He was a huge supporter of my grandmother. 
who you see on, uh, on the left side of the picture. And um, he, he helped her through many times and he, he was uh, very good to my grandmother and it was very fitting he f cut the ribbon there. One of the, uh, the other interesting things that happened back in that era, during the Cold War era of the late 50s, the Canadian government, which was led by Prime Minister Diefenbaker at the time, decided they were going to build a new radar defense network across Canada. One of the sites was to be located in Howick Township near Clifford, but the whole deal was conditional on the fact that the communications cables had to be buried. Well, Dad went to visit some friends in the construction business, and uh, soon they developed plans to build a cable plow out of an old World War II gun carrier. They successfully installed the underground cable to the radar site, but the project was canceled before it was ever completed. The project provided the experience and equipment to enter into the contracting business. From this time on, buried cables and infrastructure became the standard and preferred method of construction. The slide we're looking at is a little bit newer, but if you see the plow behind the, the dozer, that's the plow, even though that picture was likely taken in the latter half of the 1960s. During the 1950s and 60s and even into the 70s, there was growing pressure from all independent companies to upgrade their infrastructure, from outside cables to switching platforms. Uh, most companies couldn't afford it, and, and the improvements were very costly. And so they either sold themselves to other independents or to Bell. By 1975, there were only 40 companies remaining, and of those 40, about 24 were privately owned. During the 50s and 60s, Dad had assumed a much stronger management and leadership role. And in the early 60s, Dad acquired this group of companies, Bannock Municipal, Aiton Telephone, Normby Telephone, Roxer Rural, Howick. And in 64, the Aiton, Bantic, and Normby systems were integrated into a new network with a new step-by-step -step exchange installed in both Aiton and Newstead. Dad, you'll see on the left, 1965, he was a founding director for the Ontario Telephone Association and served several terms as a director and eventually the president. He was also a director of the Canadian Independent Telephone Association. These trade associations lobbied governments and worked to improve customer services and negotiated settlements with Bell and other carriers on behalf of association members. And it wasn't until 1967 that the business actually became incorporated. Up until then, it had always been run, I think, as a sole proprietorship. And uh, so it was incorporated under a new name of Whiteman Telephone Limited. Now, prior to 69, you remember I told you that Dad had bought a couple of companies uh, the Roxler and Howie Company, and uh, he bought these in 66, in fact, and they were two neighboring companies. The boundary of the two companies actually ran up the main street of a small community called Gorey, which was a small town in the middle of Howick Township. This meant that people wanting to call across the street or call neighbor to neighbor had to make a long distance call. And this problem went on for years. The Ontario Telephone Services Commission finally got involved with it, and they ended up recommending that both companies should sell to one single new owner who would put a single new exchange in, merge the two, and solve the problem. So the OTSC, at the time, approached Dad and asked if he'd be interested. Well, Dad went and he was able to purchase both companies within two days at two consecutive annual meetings. And by 69, there was a single new step-by-step -step exchange installed in Gorey 
to serve both former companies. This would double the number of lines in, uh, for us to about 2,000. Now, by the early 1970s, of course, because we were um, in the business of bearing cable, uh, most of the lines had been replaced with, with buried plant. So 1971, the Clifford Exchange remained one of the last manual switchboards in the area. This was replaced in late 71 with a new step switch in the office on William Street in Clifford, and this is a picture of it here. And of course, uh, sadly, in one way, this ended my grandmother's switchboard career. But she continued to work in the business office every day until 1975. In 1976, she passed away. Her career had spanned 50 years. During her ownership, the company experienced significant growth in both the number of subscribers as well as significant financial growth. And in 2006, our grandmother, Lila Whiteman, was inducted into Canada's Telecommunications Hall of Fame. Following her death, Dad acquired sole ownership of the company. And this is a really nice, when you talk about her accomplishments, it's very hard to sum up. But the quote on the right side of this slide is a quote that was read by Alorn Abagov, who was the founder of the Hall of Fame and uh, very instrumental in, in, in recognizing her. And I think it's very fitting. During uh, my dad's era, an agreement between the Independence and Bell were established, and it was called the Long Distance Commission and Line Hall Agreement. The agreement provided for the division of long distance revenues between Bell and the independent companies. The line haul portion of this agreement provided a revenue source based on the number of circuits and the distance required to haul the long distance traffic. Companies that allowed Bell to haul the traffic directly into their exchanges were not eligible for line haul compensation. During the upgrading processes of the late 60s and early 70s, Dad developed an internal transmission network that carried all of our long distance traffic and handed off to Bell at a designated point of connection. By making this investment, he was able to maximize the commission and line haul revenues. Commission and line haul provided significant source of revenue for all independents during that era. Um, and the, I think it would be safe to say that the vast majority of revenues back in the 60s and 70s likely came from long distance revenues. And uh, that, that has completely changed in today's environment. Um, and eventually this agreement would end after the introduction of long distance competition in the 90s, 1990s. And during the 70s and 80s, significant resources were directed at service improvements these included continued buried of cables uh, to improve transmission and reduce party lines, EAS or extended area service as we called it, which was free calling to neighboring exchanges was expanded, switching and carrier upgrades. I can go on and on just to name a few, uh, but it was a time of a, a, an awful lot of upgrades to make sure we kept current. In the early 80s, Industry Canada issued cellular licenses to wireline carriers across Canada. And that included Whiteman, and we received one of those licenses. In 85, Blair and I started Whiteman Communications to sell competitive t equipment to customers outside of our telephone areas. Uh, this was a direct result of the CRTC deregulating telephone sets and customer equipment, commonly known as terminal equipment. And here's a picture of Dad 
Uh, that particular picture is in the mid-90s. In 87, Dad retired but retained ownership. His career spanned over 40 years. His experience ranged from wooden magneto phones to common battery switchboards to electromechanical step-by-step -step switching, digital switching. Uh, the company continued with Blair and I in management roles. I served as president. He is, uh, Blair served as vice president. And in 07, Dad was inducted into the Ontario Agriculture Hall of Fame for his work to improve telecommunications in rural Ontario. Dad passed away at age 87 in 2017. Well, here we are. <laughs> Blair and I uh, had an, in, an interest in being involved in the business from a very young age. As young kids, we'd string wire and hook up phones and intercoms in every corner of the apartment building and the office building. If we found an old phone laying around, we'd take it apart to see what made it work and what might be wrong with it. Oftentimes, we'd repair it, clean it up, and put it back into service. In the evenings, we'd often slip downstairs and visit Grandma. If she was working at the switchboard, she'd let us sit by the board with her. And she would teach us how to connect a call and ring the phone at the distant end. I was always amazed at how she knew which plug to put in which jack, as well as she'd give us jobs in the business office. At billing time, she'd let us run her machine that addressed uh, all of the uh, envelopes. It would stamp the names and addresses on. on. And uh, the bills themselves were actually manually calculated and handwritten in those days. If we did a good job, she'd pay us a small amount, and she always had a way of making us feel very important when we were doing that operation. And many times we'd race home from school just to jump in the trucks and with the linemen and the repairmen. We learned an awful lot about climbing poles and stringing wires and cables and how to shoot troubles. By about 1967, I, I was working part-time in the summers and weekends. In those days, we worked 10-hour days, five and a half days a week. My first job, uh, first day on the job, we had to go out to the Mulkey Corner and dig a whole bunch of pole holes. They had to be five feet deep so that we could erect these poles and uh, connect a new customer. In those days, we didn't have a line truck or a backhoe, so all the poles were dug by hand. In 1971, the Clifford Exchange was being prepared for conversion to dial. This meant that someone had to go to each house in town and upgrade the phones and test them to ensure they'd work on the new system. Every day after school, Blair would get on his bike with his tools and all the necessary parts, go door to door, and ensured that everything was in good working order. After I finished my schooling, I continued to work, but soon found I wanted to learn more about the technical parts of the operation. I went to work for a company called Automatic Electric, which would have been a similar company to Northern. And they built switching and transmission systems. And by the mid-70s, I had returned home and, and started a full-time career in the family business. I started in a technical role, excuse me, in a technical role and uh, looking after the switching and transmission and later progressed into administration and management. Blair went off and attended college in Western Canada where you could get a telecom course. And in the late 70s, he began working full time and took a leading role in outside plant design and improvements. By 1991, Blair and I had become fourth generation owners of the Whiteman Group of Companies, and today we share a common vision for the future. In 1990, we replaced the entire switching network with a Stromberg Carlson digital switch. This would provide a platform to install remote switches in rural and remote areas to dramatically improve service and eliminate party lines. And by 1992, the CRTC had approved long distance competition. Same year, 1992, 
We went to work and purchased a controlling interest in South Bruce Rural Telephone, which is a neighboring company you can see in this overhead uh, that had the Miami and Teeswater exchanges. This acquisition would double Whiteman's size to about 6,000. And in 1995, we began offering dial-up internet access. I have to tell you an embarrassing story. Back in the early 90s, I had heard about this thing called the internet, and I wasn't quite sure about it. And um, somebody told me that uh, I could go to a certain place and, and learn something. I actually got in my car and drove to downtown Toronto to attend a one-day course on how to use email and a browser. And of course, in those days, it was pretty revolutionary, and now it's like second nature. And you know, back in the early 90s, you had probably just bought your first fax machine. What would you ever need email for? The fax machine was probably the shortest lived a uh, piece of equipment you ever had around the office. So, uh, but that really uh, began our entrance into the, the whole internet game. Of course, by 96, we had built a new head office at 100 Elora Street in Clifford. And in 97, we bought Maitland Cable. They were a small cable TV company that operated in Clifford and other, a few other local areas. But the important thing here is that uh, Maitland really was the uh, basis for us to use as a springboard to get into bigger and better things. Eventually, Maitland would face the need to digitize its service, so it just made sense to merge Maitland into our other future plans, and um, eventually it would it was, uh, gave us the opportunity to get into the IPTV game um, that we could deliver on twisted, either Twisted Pair or, or Fiber. Uh, in 97, uh, the CRTC approved local competition. What's interesting about this is it really is the beginning of some pretty quick changes that are coming and, um, and I, I, I will say I remember the next thing that happened in 98 is we started offering DSL in our own area, a digital subscriber line, which is basically high-speed internet. And there was, uh, at that time, the commission, the CRTC said, they'd love to see this happen. And um, there was a, some of the larger companies said, it'll never happen in rural Ontario, it's far too expensive. And, and, and I even heard a claim once that, uh, uh, frankly it was Bell that said, oh, it'll take 20 years to do that in a small rural exchange. We said, well, if it takes them 20 years, why don't we go in and do it? So we did. And what do you know? They were right there behind us. And so it, it proves that uh, competition uh, d does light a fire. So uh, one of the other things that happened, by the way, by the end of that, uh, the 90s, was we ended up acquiring the balance of the shares of South Bruce and then made plans to roll South Bruce into Whiteman. And, and that amalgamation was completed around 2001. So as the 1900s came to a close, we were faced with significant challenges heading into the new millennium. There was growing competition from many sources. Regulators were uh, eliminating all forms of traditional subsidies that kept rural services affordable. As well, they were driving all forms of communication towards a competitive model. All communications were quickly being converted to digital technologies. Customer needs and demands were quickly changing. As we considered the future, it became clear that if we were going to continue, it need, we needed to reinvent ourselves. We concluded that instead of responding to change as we had done for nearly a century, we needed to drive change and therefore take control of our future. 
So by 2002, Whiteman expanded its management team for the first time in 100 years, the day-to-day -day management of the business was in the hands of people from outside the family. Blair and I would step back from day-to-day -day operations. Currently, we share the responsibility of being co-chairs and retain control of the board of directors. The changes in management provided an opportunity to take advantage of new ideas and fresh perspectives. With this approach, we were able to create a new strategic direction that would put us on a trajectory for significant growth. Within months, Whiteman was the first independent company to offer high-speed DSL internet in neighboring Bell exchanges on a competitive basis. Soon after that, uh, we were the first independent telecom company in Canada to register as a CLEC. And here we go with the acronyms in our industry. I can tell you there's actually dictionaries written full of telecom acronyms. Competitive local exchange carrier with the intention of offering competitive local exchange services via DSL. In 06, the demand for bandwidth was growing significantly. In order to stay competitive, there was a need to upgrade the entire digital network uh, with an IP-based network. And soon it was apparent that we were becoming recognized for our efforts. Over the next few years, we started to win all kinds of community awards. For in our serving areas for uh, all kinds of good things. And uh, it, part of it is, too, uh, our, our involvement in the community. We continue to support uh, the communities that we serve. And, and we give generously to local health care, youth programs, education, and other worthy causes. Uh, this this uh, overhead, by the way, uh, shows uh, a prior manager uh, pointing at the first fiber connection in Mount Forest in 06. Um, so it, it goes back that far. In 08, what do you know, we had hit a 100-year anniversary. So we decided to commission a book. And this is a picture of the cover. And uh, that book is called The First 100 Years. And it's really uh, a history book that captures family history, industry history, and community history. And um, it's, a, it's a collection of a, a little bit of everything. It's not just about the family. It's about a whole bunch of stuff that has gone on over the last 100 years. And uh, we're pretty proud of it. It's available. Uh, very few copies of it left in circulation, but it's available in most local libraries that we, in the communities we serve. If you want a copy, get a hold of somebody and we'll see if we can dig one up. So one of the things we embarked on um, in 08 was a very ambitious strategy and probably the most ambitious thing that the company had ever done in its 100-year history. Uh, we were the first in Canada, outside of a few trials and a few subdivisions in Toronto, to launch fiber to the home on a competitive basis. The first towns were Mount Forest, Harrison, Palmerston, and Listowel. Our service offerings included voice, data, and IPTV. Soon to follow was the cellular service. and. Uh, you know, we, we were able to bundle these together to give customers whatever it was that, to uh, suit their needs. This project presented many major challenges and risks for the company. The demand for our fiber to the home service soon proved we were on the right track and uh, the growth was unbelievable. Based on the experience we gained in the first four towns, we were able to create a standard deployment model we still use today to start new projects. 
I, I have to say that uh, it's easier for me in doing this to come up with information and talk about the prior 100 years than the last 10 years. The last 10 or 20 years seems like a blur. And a lot of times it's actually hard to find uh, good photos or graphics that depict uh, what it is we're talking about. But here we're looking at fiber pipe that is ready to go in the ground. It's just representative of that time. Um, in 2012, we fibered Hanover. In 13, we did Walkerton. In 14, we started Center Wellington. In 18, we started Stratford. And in 20, we started Orangeville. In addition to these areas, we're also working to complete fiber builds in our historic and incumbent areas. At this time, Teeswater and Formosa are fibered with Fordwich, Gorey, and Rocks that are soon to follow next year. And uh, the, the remainder, remainder of the few towns uh, will be completed in the near future. To date, we pass tens of thousands of homes and businesses with our fiber infrastructure. The vast majority of our customers receive their services via a fiber connection. Today, our network stretches from Own Sound to Stratford to Orangeville, including most towns in between. Whiteman has become a major regional facilities-based provider of communication services. And somebody said, well, what is the key to success? I'm not sure I figured that out, by the way, but I think one of the key pieces here, and it's a great piece of work, our management team came up with this vision, mission, and value statement. And Today, they use that set of values to assist them in making their decisions. And I remember being at a board meeting when this was presented to the board, and they said, and I said, this is wonderful. It's a wonderful piece of work. It's a beautiful message, and uh, you know the values strike right at the heart. And I said, what's very unique about it is that these values are likely the same values that our parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents used in their day-to-day -day life. The only difference was they never would have thought to write them down. But if you come into our office uh, and or any of our workplaces, these are everywhere, and we use them to guide us in our decisions. They are the keys to success. So uh, here's a slide um, that uh, talks about Blair and I and our accomplishments. Uh, I, I caution this because we're not done yet. <laughs> we still have some time to go. Um, but one of the most significant things that we will accomplish in the next few years is a transition plan to the next generation. And so I present um, our families. And this isn't a new picture. This, this picture is a few years old. But it's, it's a nice picture because we're all together here. And uh, you can see my wife and I and uh, Blair and Rosemary and uh, each of our three kids. And of course, dad's here. So that represents uh, three generations of the five. Um, so, as I said, we've been, over the past several years, we've been working on a framework for succession to the uh, next generation. Uh, we each have three adult children committed to continuing the family legacy. We refer to this group as the Gen 5s. And of the six Gen 5s, three currently have careers within the company. The remaining three have professional el careers elsewhere. They're all involved at the board level and are all responsible for various board duties. And each of the six Gen 5s are currently enrolled in programs that will prepare them for ownership and the responsibility of working together at the board level for the common good. It is our goal to complete the succession process in the coming years. 
And the last slide is looking to the future. I like to put this up kind of in stark contrast if you remember the very first slide where we saw Robert beside his Blake telephone in his farmhouse, his early beginnings. We can't, I can't predict the future and talk about where things might end up in the next hundred years, but this is a stark contrast when we look at the differences between what went on 100 year, or 113 years ago and what's going on today. So um, with that, uh, Amy I, and, and Emily, I toss it back and I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions. Thank you for that fantastic presentation, Paul. So poignant to hear the history and the transition of Whiteman for over 112, I guess, or 13 years. And to have you here with us tonight is fantastic. Thank you again. I'm going to put it to the floor now to people to ask questions. We're, if you're able to, we can maybe stick around for a bit more. Um, Emily, would you want to bring that up? Sure, um, yeah. Sorry, we have we have we're working on together on this tonight, <laughs> and we have quite a few questions. So I'm going to hand this over to Emily now, and then she'll read the questions to you, Paul, and we'll move forward. Yes, so if, if you have any questions that you would like to ask Paul, again, feel free to type them into the chat box here and uh, we'll read them out um, to him so that he'll be able to answer them for you. Um, while we wait for a couple of questions to come in, there's been a lot of people um, saying hello and um, making comments about the talk and how well they enjoyed it. So thank you all so much for, for give, um, giving us some feedback um, and for saying hello. We love to uh, love to see everybody and, and hear from everybody so while we wait maybe we can come up with some questions right here on the spot <laughs> um paul uh, can you explain explain a bit about the term step you had mentioned step exchanges and step equipment oh. uh, step by step uh is a is a is a term we used for the type of a telephone switch an automatic switch and basically it was a electromechanical switch that was controlled by the old rotary dials and they would go click, 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 click. Well, that, that controlled a, what was referred to as a step switch that would step through a series of digits and uh, if you dialed enough digits, seven digits, you would ultimately end up with the uh, person you wanted. Um, so it's, it's kind of a, a, a technical term, I suppose you would call it, and for a, uh, a type of electromechanical telephone switch. If you come to my house, I can show you some. Because I've got... I've got <laughs> do you still have, uh, within the collection at Whiteman, do you have a range of different telephones than the head office at Clifford? We do. We do, we have, uh, we were just, I, in fact, I was talking to some staff today about re refreshing the display, but we do have uh, a small collection of stuff in the lobby and uh, one of the old uh, Magneto switchboards, I think, in the lobby. And if people want to drop in and see, there are some nice old artifacts there. So our first question from Keith here. Um, in your first dial exchange, um, I think it was Newstead. What type of dial equipment was used? Was it SXS or some other type? No, it it wasn't a step by step switch. It was a it was a they called it a rear axe, and it was a series of rotary switches, and not not a uh, two motion vertical horizontal switch, which that will likely help confuse most people, but. Um, I, Blair might remember if he's on the call, but I, I don't remember the name of the company, but the brand on the switch it was called a Rear Axe. I think it was actually intended for a PABX application, to be honest, because it was only a four-digit switch. Um, from Brenda, how many employees currently work for the company? I think we're somewhere north of 140. I think. Uh, between 140 and 150, I think I'm safe in saying. 
So probably around 145. Um, from David, many small businesses are having a difficult time accessing reliable high-speed internet. What is Whiteman doing to meet this need? Are there government grants available that you can apply for help for fiber lines? Some. Uh, I think there are government programs to help fund certain applications. Uh, uh, you know, if I get into this in great detail, we'll be here for three more hours, but I think uh, for the for the homeowner or the business owner, I'm not sure there's anything available, uh, if that's the nature of the question. But certainly, there are some programs coming through the provincial government that they're going to fund some rural regions for fiber builds. Mm -hmm. I think Adams yeah, are doing this. The SWIFT program, we so we are at 8.08. Is there any other questions? Oh, thanks, Adam. I might have known you'd be behind it. Willowick just commented. Um, are there any other questions out there that um, we can stick around for a bit more? Uh, Virginia's commenting, this month we found a third edition of the book, How to Build Rural Telephone Lines. It's also very interesting to see you had the photo at the beginning of your talk. I believe, if my memory's right, we had that particular book in the museum display at the Wellington Museum some years ago, or a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do. Um, we were selling it in the gift shop at one point, and then we also have a copy here at the archives. So what we'll do after our discussion here is I'll, we'll just put down our website so you can check it out online. We have a, our collection is available online to peruse. And I invite you to come to the museum um, here between Ferguson and Alora and also the archives and you can come and look at that resource here. It's also within the public library system. So that book would be available through Aboyne, Boyne, Fergus and Alora locally around here. We, we do have within Wellington County 14 branches. So I do encourage you to go to our website too and look through the libraries. Well, thank you, everyone. I think I think we're done here, Paul. Unless you have anything you'd like to to chat about. No, it's it's been a pleasure. It has been a pleasure having you here for our third installment, and thank you, everyone, for participating. It's been such a successful, almost a virtual, intimate space where we <laughs> chat and hang out. Um, we do miss in-person presentations, but. This has been a great opportunity for us too to outreach with all of you across the county and across Canada. I did see across Canada and the United States, I should mention, there was someone here from Michigan. So a shout out to our um, neighbors in the United States for joining us this evening. And with that said, I guess we'll say goodbye to everyone and thank you for joining us. And just to make mention that we will have this is um, filmed and we will make this av available for you in case you're interested in seeing it again on our website. So thank you again.